All right, so welcome to this webinar that's brought to you by the Illinois Council of Teachers of Mathematics. Um, today's webinar is actually pretty exciting. We have special guest speakers. Um, these two educators will be speakers at the upcoming NCTM Regional Conference, um, David Weiss and Jennifer Kim. Um, and actually this conference, the NCTM Regional Conference, is going to be in place of our ICTM Annual Conference. Um, so we wanted to bring some highlighted speakers to you to kind of um, get some excitement for that upcoming conference um, and also bring you some professional development, obviously. So um, I'm Annie Forrest. I'm on the ICTM Board of Directors. I'm in charge of moderating our webinars. Um, I just wanted to give a reminder before we started about how questions work. So if you have questions during the webinar, you can go ahead and put them in the questions um, area. And uh, not at all participants will see your questions. They just come to me, and I will kind of curate those questions and um, give them to our speakers at appropriate times, either during or after. Um, and if you have any other questions, you can put them in that as well. When we are finished with the webinar, if you could take a few moments to fill out the survey that we will share with you, that would be very helpful because we use that information for planning our future webinars. Um, so I am going to go ahead now and introduce our two speakers. Uh, first, we have David. He's a, form a formative assessment specialist for New Visions for Public Schools in New York City. He has 25 years' experience in education and has taught in such far-flung places as New York City, London, Bangkok, and Vancouver. David currently works remotely from his island paradise of Denman Island, British Columbia. These are his words, by the way. Uh, and then we also have Jennifer, join, and she joined New Visions in 2013. She is responsible for collaborating with high school math teacher teams and New Vision staff to produce inquiry-based curriculum aligned to the Common Core Learning Standards. She previously taught math to middle school and high school students. She holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Barnard College and a master's degree in secondary education from Loyola, Loyola Marymount. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the screen over to our speakers and let them get started. Great. Uh, I am going to show my screen. <clears throat> there are a lot of little windows open, so it takes time to find the right button. And I, um, there you go. Great. Um, so we are going to basically try to preview some of the presentations and workshops we're intending to do at NCTM. And hopefully you will walk away after this either being excited to go and attend uh, our series of workshops or at least having some resources so you can learn further on your own. Because I know that not everybody's going to be able to uh, make the workshops. Um, uh, we work for the New Visions for Public Schools, which is a nonprofit organization that is sort of part of the puzzle of trying to figure out how to support New York City's 1.1 million students, uh, which is uh, the largest school district in the United States. In fact, uh, it's larger than the next five largest school districts put together. Um, and it's, as a result, a lot of um, there are a lot of sort of like jigsaw puzzles that have to be solved across the city because services are not always provided evenly, etc. New Visions for Public Schools supports uh, teachers and administrators and other people in education um, with curriculum, with professional learning. Um, <clears throat> we're kind of famous for our school systems work. Uh, I would say that our curriculum professional learning work is still uh, somewhat emerging relative to the systems work. Um, Jen and I and uh, two other colleagues, Sarah Taguchi and Elizabeth Ramirez, are um, trying an experiment at the NCTM Regionals where we're each lead speakers for one of these topics, but all four of these topics are really connected together. And we noticed that when we went to NCTM that we found it really hard to get like a really coherent picture of our work out in one 75-minute session. Um, usually we felt like participants really walked away not seeing enough of the picture to really understand the work. So uh, we talked to NCTM, and they agreed that they would let us, as long as each, all four of us go and we're each lead speakers on our separate proposals, and all four proposals had to be accepted, they would let us treat these as a sequence. So we designed four workshops, and each workshop is set up so that you should learn something if you go to it, even if you don't attend the other workshops. You'll learn some 
element that's helpful. But you'll learn a lot more if you attend all four. That's the theory. And they, they're going to focus on sort of different areas of the work. We're going to start with just experiencing the instructional routines. That's going to be the primary focus. So what does an instructional routine look like? What does it feel like? A few different times. And then we'll unpack it, and we'll really try to focus on what components of it engage and support all, all learners. Then we'll get some planning time sort of a structured planning time around using those routines and maybe doing a bit of uh, practicing of the routine. And then finally, the end, we'll sort of focus on the idea of rehearsals. Um, I think this is being recorded, so all of these slides and information will be um, findable later. Um, I wanted to talk about why we focus on instructional routines. Um, we have a theory of action around it, and I think that knowing what the theory is helps you decide as a, as a learner whether it's something you want to engage in. Um, you may be familiar with some of the routines on the left, or maybe less so. I feel like uh, you would be pretty hard-pressed not to have heard of number talks, and, and maybe you've heard of problem strings, and then these other instructional routines are a little less uh, famous, um, choral counting, diagram for meaning, etc. Uh, we use the bottom two routines in our work, connecting representations and contemplate and calculate. And those two routines came from um, Amy and Grace, Amy Lucenta, Grace Kalamenic, who were consultants who worked with teachers to develop instructional routines. They're really classroom tested um, with real kids in real classrooms to try to develop routines that would help get at different elements of mathematics. And one thing that's a little different about contemplating, calculating, connecting representations is they're far more specified as to what the routine means than a number talk is. Number talks, to me, are done in many, many different ways. <clears throat> One of the ways Grace says you know something is routine is that if you walked into two different classrooms with two different teachers with different groups of kids, that you could still pick out what was similar in those two classrooms across the two classrooms. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So uh, another sort of part of the theory of instructional routines is that they should be contain elements of high, high quality instruction. Um, it wouldn't be very useful if we were like developing routines that didn't have good teaching as part of them. So we have these sort of different things that could be supports for all learners, and some of those are packaged into the instructional routine. So if you're doing the instructional routine, following the flow of the routine, then chances are high you're embedding instructional elements that are helpful for all of your kids. And that re reusing those elements over time is more helpful for your kids than to start doing once in a while. So that's another part of the, the routine nature of the instruction. Um, this, is, this particular idea around cognitive focus is true for all kids, regardless of what routine they're involved in. Um, you know, in fact, actually, uh, the United States is a cultural routine they follow. Canada, too, I think, follows pretty much the same one, which is like, first we're going to go over the homework, and then we're going to uh, do a mini lesson, and then we'll do some guided practice, some independent practice, maybe some reflection at the end, and we'll sign homework for the next day. That's a routine, and that routine has the same benefits as the routines that we involve, although uh, it doesn't necessarily embed the instructional supports that we think are necessary for all kids to benefit. Uh, when you use an instructional routine, uh, a lot of concerns of kids that are always on their minds get minimized, and they are then have more cognitive space available to be thinking about their own reasoning and other students' reasoning and thinking less about what am I supposed to do next, what's my job, uh, what's my role, what does it look like to be successful. These are all concerns that weigh on kids, and anything that weighs on kids necessarily reduces their capacity to do and learn mathematics. Um, the other key benefit of routines is that uh, if you're teaching in four different classrooms with four different group of kids, and you're all teaching different content, and then you try to come together as teachers to collaborate around your practice, you have almost, well, you have very little in common to talk about. It might take you a while to figure out what you should be talking about. So you, you're representing different colors, different flavors of teaching. And you need quite a bit of specificity in what you're talking about before everybody's got a sense of what's being talked about. With instructional routines, you have at least this one topic. It doesn't have to be everything. We don't expect people to use routines all the time. But you have this at least this one topic where 
your teaching is substantially similar enough that you're now able to more easily talk about it and potentially notice some possibly important variation in what you're doing. Um, instructional routines are a form of formative assessment. Um, in the United States, uh, people are very familiar with the column and scholar all the checks, engineering effective classroom discussions that elicit evidence of learning, and a little less familiar sometimes with the other elements of formative assessment. Um, this is Dylan Williams' framework, so if you're like, oh, formative assessment, I'd love to learn more about that, I recommend a book, and I think actually uh, Dylan might be speaking at this conference. Uh, he's got a book called Embedded Formative Assessment. And so we see that the instructional routines embed some of these elements of formative assessment, in particular activating learners as instructional resources for each other and activating learners as owners of their own learning. Those are two key elements of the instructional routines that are actually often really hard to figure out how to do for yourself as a teacher. So um, I, what I want to do is is to actually try out this routine once. <clears throat> we have a small limitation, uh, which is that when I ask you to type things, I can't see what you've typed. So we've got a workaround, which is that when I ask you to type things like noticings or responses, etc., you can just ask it as a question. So you can just use that question box, and I won't see it directly. Annie can sort of summarize some of them and share them uh, with us when they come up. Does that sound good? I don't know great. If still, okay, great, excellent. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to be practicing. Oh, sorry, hang on. Uh, while doing this, it's helpful if you have teacher questions, etc., to hold off until the end, and just for a moment, try to be a kid in a classroom, part of the routine, uh, play the role of students, um, and just see what it feels like to be a student within the routine, because that'll give you some empathy as to what it would feel like if you were having to use it with your students. How would, what would their experience be like? So think like a student, speak like a student. Um, good morning, class. We are going to do contemplate and calculate. We are going to be practicing looking for calculation shortcuts, using what you know about way counting and area work. And again, we're going to be doing this to think like mathematicians to learn how to find calculation shortcuts using mathematical structure. Um, the routine is four steps, always the same. First, you get a chance to notice, mostly independently, then you get try to find a calculation shortcut with a partner, and then you're going to share and study your strategies with the whole group. And finally, at the end, we're going to reflect on learning. And, and kind of the goal of reflection at the end here, just so you can keep that in mind, is what did I learn today that I can use to solve some other problem? Because I'm not really going to see this problem ever again. So I kind of always want to be thinking about what did I learn today that I could take away and use again tomorrow. Um, I'm going to be flashing an image just for a moment. Um, I will put it up back up later. You get a chance to look at it in more detail later. But we're just going to flash it, and I want you to think about when I flash it, what do you think might be mathematically important about what I'm going to share? We all ready? So it's going to be in the middle of my screen, uh, in the, I guess the bottom left or something of your screen. Uh, in three, two, one. Okay, not very long. Think about what you saw. Okay, um, would you take a moment and use the question box to share something that you noticed? And uh, while we're doing this, I am going to set up my screen so I can see that. I'm going to turn off my webcam. So don't, you don't need to be seeing me anymore. Where's my side panel? There it is. Okay, great. So. You should be able to type things into the question box, and Annie should be able to share those with me. <clears throat> and well, all we want you to do is just share one thing that you noticed. Would you like me to read some of these to you then? Yeah, can I hear some of them? That'd be great. Um, lots of little circles in a geometric shape. I noticed there was a lot of circles. Um, there were dots, two clumps of arrays with a bump dot on each clump, an array of small circles, a big lump of dots on top, big lump of dots under it. All right. That um, sounds pretty good. That's okay. good. That's sure. good. That's enough. <laughs> I would normally, uh, I don't need to hear every, everybody's noticings. Sure. Um, 
And so I would normally, so I'm stepping out of the routine slightly because we, we kind of have to because we're in a webinar and we're not face-to-face. -face. I would normally go around and listen to kids talking to each, other, to each other about these noticings and then maybe choose some of those to share or have some volunteers share a few noticings. Not a lot, just enough to get started. So I'm going to go back into the slides. Oh, interesting. I can't, can you see this thing on top of mine? That doesn't seem very helpful. The go. Um, there we go. Minimize. Great. Okay. So, um, the the task is going to be to try to figure out the number of those circles in your head without counting every single circle, and to be prepared to explain why your strategy works. So, I'm going to put up the uh, picture again, and I just want you to take a moment and think to yourself, how could I find this number of circles without counting every single one? Okay, so now what I want you to do is imagine, because we can't actually do it, uh, but imagine that you are now going to be working with a partner to describe one of your calculation shortcuts. So in the question box, will you again pretend you're talking to somebody else and describe to them your calculation shortcut? I guess you are talking to somebody else. You're all talking to Annie. And I'm going to minimize this again. I maximize this. Okay, so I'll give you about a minute to think about if you come up with a calculation strategy, try to see if you can come up with a more efficient one than the one you have. Right now, just to imagine we were in a classroom. I would be walking around and try to listen in and get a sense of strategies from different pairs of kids all around the room, sort of as many as I can collect, so that I can pick some of them to share with the room. So, Annie, you're my co-teacher. Can you take sure. a look at some of these strategies and see if you can find one that might be, like, interesting to start with and just well, describe it? Well, that their strategy was to find the fattest array they could. Mm. And then they noticed they did that, and then there was three wild ones. Got it. Mm -hmm. So did, are they saying that they um, create, do you think they created two arrays? Or do you think that they squished these all into one big, big array? Um, Hard to tell from what they said, right? Yeah, it's so, a little bit tricky. Yeah. So what I would do is that would be the kind of question I might lead with once we've got that out on the table. Uh, and I would use some annotation, et cetera, to it in order to get that picture uh, described. Let's see if we can get another strategy. Sure. And just as a heads up, people can... Okay. <laughs> um, so would you like me to share another... Yeah, um... let's, hear, let's hear another strategy. Sure. Um, well, there are some people that went straight to sort of a equation with just numbers. Mm. Um, uh, and then some people that more kind of explained in words. Um, I see two three by four arrays, which is twelve plus twelve, and then I add on the three additional dots for a total of twenty-seven. Mm, and that's so that's it would be a connection between those two strategies. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now what I would do is we would present those strategies to the room, and so I would have probably me stand up there and point at the picture while people are talking so that when the kid says three by four array, I'm going to point at the array and try to highlight it in some way with my hand so that everybody knows what I'm talking about. Um, there's often some mathematical ambiguity in what when people are describing things, and that makes it harder for people to figure out what's going on. So when a strategy is presented, I really want to make sure that people are clear on, on exactly what is being presented. Um, and try to be as precise as possible using my hands. And then what I'll do afterwards is then I'll annotate the strategy. So I'm because I can't do that through this platform, I'm going to put up three sample annotations. So here's one. Just take a moment and think about uh, what's being represented in that annotation. And I, I typed this out so it would look nice for this webinar, but normally I would write it by hand, obviously. So, uh, Annie, that's kind of like the second strategy that you talked about, right? The two three-by-four arrays. 
in yes, the three so extras. Yes, there were a few people that had that, yes. Yeah. Um, and so here I'm using color. I don't know if that's totally obvious or if there's just too much color. feels maybe a little too much right now, but to use color to make sure that the thing that's being talked about is connected. So the symbols down at the bottom there, we know where that three came from. We know what the three is describing in the diagram. So that's, that's why it's an annotation rather than, let's say, uh, just a description of the strategy in words. Um, here's another strategy, which we didn't hear today. So you can think about what's being represented by this annotation. And then maybe um, could you add in the question thing sort of share what do you think this strategy is uh, trying to mean in words? Um, Andy, do we have any that have been shared so far that we can hear? Yeah, a few people saying one person said mirror image or reflection, um, and somebody saying something that's exactly duplicated. Mm-hmm. Right, and those two things are uh, synonyms for each other in this case, right? The mirror image and the exact duplicates are um, really interesting. So, uh, and that the goal is that ideally when you look at this as a child or somebody learning the math, that you can read the strategy from the diagram. So that if you are spaced out for a moment or you don't hear the person, that there is a public record of what was being described that you can then reference and use as needed for the rest of the, the session. Here's a third strategy. Take a moment to think about that. What is, what's being described there? And this, this is a little, I, I don't know for sure, but it might be a little bit like the first strategy we heard. And there's the three extra in the middle of we made actually one giant array. So that's kind of neat. Yeah, somebody said, said that it was finding all the groups of three. Mm. That's how they this. All the groups of three. How many groups of three are there? There are nine groups of three. Yeah, that's definitely connected to this. Um, so then... Uh, at the end of the routine, we would want to reflect. Again, uh, how I would normally run this is I would put up this prompt after we'd finished the discussion around the strategies. Then I would ask you to write for a minute, a minute and a half in response to one of these prompts. I've given you a lot of the language, so you have to sort of just invent the stuff that might fill in the blanks. Maybe take a moment and think about how you would fill these in. Uh, and I'll add that I've put you at a slight disadvantage, which is that normally these posters would still be up so that when you were thinking about the language you wanted to use here, you'd have those visuals to reference. Um, okay, and then you know, maybe you've thought for a little bit. So then what we would do is I would go around and read some of those responses, collect a few of them to share, prepare people perhaps to share their reflection, possibly try to be really strategic about what's shared. Uh, I imagine some students might write things like, it's really helpful to find the groups or to find the things that are similar or to change the shape so that it is easier to count. There are different ways people might get at describing these three strategies and trying to generalize from them to something else, right? So changing the shape of something, looking for re repetition, looking for symmetry, these are all more generalizable and more useful than, than just this one task. Okay, so uh, then we would record those. Um, I'm going to just talk really briefly and then we'll open up to more questions. So one is that the work that I need to do to prepare for this routine is basically the five practices or the five plus practices. Um, so what's my goal? That's practice zero. It's unfortunately not in this book. Uh, what are students going to do with this math? What, um, how am I going to keep track of what they've done? 
How am I going to use it by selecting some of those strategies? What order of those strategies might I use? So here, I might use this order because the strategy one here is very accessible. Virtually everybody sees that strategy. And uh, some people go on and say, well, can I do better? Um, strategy two, um, people definitely see it once they somebody suggested it as, as a thing, but fewer people see it. So it's, it's, I think, useful to sort of share after we've unpacked a little bit. And then strategy three, actually, having done this particular task many times, only seen it a couple times total out of the maybe 12 or so times I've used this particular task with groups of people. So it's uncommon. So if I get a strategy that's kind of uncommon, I like sharing it kind of at the end. Um, and then trying to connect across those strategies. That's kind of how, how the reflection helps as well. So you're actually trying to reflect across the different strategies. So when I'm choosing reflections, I kind of want to pick something that's going to connect back to the different strategies, but also connect across the strategies. So there's a good book you can get. It's not even very expensive. It's called The Five Practices, and it's totally applicable whatever grade level you're teaching. Uh, and you, you can use this book even if you're not um, using a routine or any of our work uh, after this. Um, there are three other resources that you might find helpful. There is a book uh, about routines called Routines for Reasoning by Grace Kalamanek and Amy Lucenta and Susan Jansen Creighton. Creighton? Uh, I know the first two people much better than the third. Um, and so they actually created the routine that we just sort of semi kind of experienced. Um, and they created a few more, and they're in this book, and they're described in some detail. There is an open, not open source, but free resource. TED.org is a website that's got different routines, including Contemplate and Calculate. Three-act tasks are described, mental math, quick images, counting collections, other routines that are uh, available on that website. And then finally, um, because our curriculum is open source, if you go to this URL, curriculum.newvisions.org forward slash math, you can go and use all of our resources for free. Um, they're free to you because we got paid to do the work with a grant. So they're professional-ish, I hope, quality resources provided for free because of a, it was grant funded. Uh, and that is, those are all of the slides that I have. So if I press escape, I should probably turn off screen sharing so you're not staring at my background. And I'll um, turn on my webcam so people can see my face if they have questions. David, there was another um, website, Fostering Math Practices, which is also referenced in the book. Ah, good call. Uh, so it's, um, is it www fosteringmathpractices.com. Yep. Maybe, uh, Annie, could you throw that in the chat for people? Can I throw in the yes. chat? Yes, and I also will put all these resources in um, the follow-up emails that come out, too, so people can have them then. But can you tell me that one again, Fostering Math? What was that? I, I sent it to you in the, in the chat, fosteringmathpractices.com. Okay. So that's the website uh, that goes along with the book, Routines for Reasoning. Perfect. Um, all right, so do you, do you, are you ready for a few questions then that kind of came up as you were doing that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one person was wondering, um, the task that you shared with us that we just did together, uh, what grade level um, have you done that with or do you recommend that for? Um, sorry, my wife just sent me a text message. How do I quit? No options. <laughs> I can't quit. What the heck? Sorry. Stop sending me text messages when you know that I'm in a webinar. Okay, <laughs> great, back. Um, so grade level. So I think the grade level depends on the, on the understandings of the kids. So to give it a concrete example, uh, we gave an Algebra 1 class late in the year a task where the very first part of this performance task is literally to figure out how many squares will be in the next term in a sequence, and it's given to them as a visual. So imagine one, imagine one of Fawn, uh, Fawn Wynn's visual patterns. Figure out how many in the next pattern. And out of 100 kids, we collected their student work and scanned it, and then I got a copy to look at. And out of 100 kids, 80 of those kids were counting the dots one at a time. They put dots on their paper, visible dots. So either the kids don't know another strategy for quickly counting arrays of things, or 
they're not using it because they don't feel confident in it. So I propose that this task, this, this circle task, would have been a nice way to spend 10 minutes to remi at least remind kids that they can count using multiplication. And maybe you do it more frequently than that, than that with a group of kids that, that, you know, is still actually grappling with multiplication. But you don't have time to spend weeks relearning multiplication from scratch. So you have to find ways of embedding it within your own content. So one way to use that task would be, I'm going to unpack that task. We're going to do it once. So we're going to find quick ways of counting this one item. Then we're going to situate it in an array, uh, sorry, not an array, a sequence of visuals where it's a growing sequence. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that particular sequence can grow, linear, quadratic. I think exponential is a bit tricky, but there are ways it can grow that are to the, at least linear and quadratic that nicely. Uh, and now, after we've unpacked that sequence, then we might move on to trying to figure out what kind of uh, expressions might go with it, what equations, what function rules, how are, how is the array represented as a function rule. The, on the other hand, uh, that work could have just, that work of multiplication could have just as easily started in third grade. You know, as soon as kids know a bit of multiplication, let's learn what multiplication, one thing that multiplication is really useful for, which is counting things quickly. It would be great if everybody knew that when they have arrays of things, that's super convenient for counting, right? That's a takeaway I'd want every kid to have. So third grade, you know, wherever you're working on patterns and algebra one, so the wide variety. That's the, the short answer, but I tried to, like, why is it a wide variety? I tried to explain why. Yeah, definitely. You kind of mentioned um, the importance of having a public record of um, the strategies and how you want them to kind of be up all at the same time. How do you typically um, have them all displayed, um, or what do you think is the best method for doing that, or does it get confusing to have too much stuff on one board, or just to, is there a way to manage this that? Yeah, this is a really good question. I'm going to actually display my screen again so that we're all clear what, what is meant here by public display. Can you see the annotations that we did? Yes. Okay. So uh, there are a few different ways that this is managed. One is you can use chart paper, and, and you get that sticky pad chart paper. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's fabulous because you can move it easily. That's one strategy. And you just have different posters one poster for each strategy. Uh, that's That would be expensive, though. So that would be like, I don't know, I think one of those 84 pads is $80, uh, $20, $20, $80, $20 a pad. We're talking like maybe a dollar a sheet. That look like that will add up pretty fast. Another strategy is to um, use whiteboard. And, and what do you need up? You don't need a lot of stuff up, so if you have a whiteboard space, then you can use this for three different strategies side by side. Maybe you got the noticings on one side and you've got the reflection on the other. Um, so that you can do with a single whiteboard, provided there's nothing else on it. Uh, another strategy is to use a, uh, an interactive whiteboard or a smart board and to put the strategies up on the smart board and then put the reflection portion elsewhere. So, like, so these sentence prompts right here, they don't have to be on the slides. The sentence prompts could be anywhere. You could write them up, write up the sentence prompts, leave your annotations on your smart board. That's uh, convenient if all you have is a smart board for writing space, which is surprisingly common, actually. In New York City, there are, I don't know, at least half the classrooms have a smart board installed over a perfectly serviceable chalkboard or whiteboard, which I think is classically stupid. but. Uh, I'm not in charge of installing those things. Um, does that help? Yes. Uh, yeah, I think that was like kind of my next question was, is using technology helpful or, you know, get in the way of this kind of thing? So you kind of answered that too. Yeah, so it's really good for recording stuff. Um, and it's really neat because some of these things you could record. You could imagine that like this, this one here where I'm showing the rotation with an arrow, you could imagine you could actually move those visually, you know, or show the reflection. You could imagine that some technology would actually show the reflection a bit better than what we can do on paper. It's not critical, though. If what you end up with is some pictures that have some color drawn on them, that's usually pretty good. People are, at least for a task this straightforward, people can usually visualize some of the reflections and rotations, Where, but technology might be helpful for that still. Mm -hmm. 
Um, somebody was wondering about just kind of timing, like how long do you spend on each part of this routine? And um, do you have any ideas for management of students that would work quickly and maybe start disrupting the class because they're finished or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So um, let's just go back to the beginning here. So the first two slides are kind of critical because they sort of situate kids for what we're doing today and why. But the first time you use them, maybe it's a minute and a half. And the 10th time you use them, it's 30 seconds. Here's what we're doing today and why. And you already know the steps, so we're going to skip the steps. But this is like the five-second reminder of the steps for the kids who need to know the steps each time. Uh, the noticings should be brief. Set up kids to think about what it is mathematically noticing. This uh, image depends on the task, how long you might put it up. I would say that the more complex the image is that's being displayed, the longer you want it to display. But I note that we got, um, when you were sharing those noticings off, I felt like those were useful things to notice, the arrays that people noticed. I think if maybe if, if I'd held off just slightly longer, people might have started figuring out how many there were, which means they wouldn't be listening to uh, each other when they were sharing. Sharing noticings is maybe, uh, once you've got it humming and you've done it a bit, it's maybe a minute, minute and a half. Uh, probably, I only have kids share one noticing with each other. So what did you notice? I noticed this. What did I notice? I noticed this. They take a turn sharing something. So that's quick. That can happen in 10, 15 seconds. Then you get about maybe a minute to gap, capture some noticings, and you record them up on some chart paper or a whiteboard or chalkboard or, or wherever. Uh, describing what to do next is critical. I, you'll notice that there are two slides for that, one without the picture. And the reason for that is because um, if you give people the thing to do, they start doing it and they don't listen to the instructions. So tell them the instructions, then give them the thing they need to do the, do the work. Um, and then I usually, so the trick here is I try to pick a task where in about two minutes or a minute and a half, Ideally, every kid can come up with a strategy. And what I do for groups that have got a strategy is I try to challenge them to come up with a shorter, faster, or more elegant strategy. So for the kids who come up right away and say, it's two arrays of 12 each plus three more, I'm done. And they do that in five seconds. I'm like, okay, great. You've got a strategy. And remember, we're trying to figure out shortcuts. So what's a better shortcut than the one you just gave? Then that usually keeps kids challenged and engaged for a while. Um, having sat in contemplate and calculate my son to myself, I don't know, maybe 50 times, I haven't gotten bored yet. I always try to find some other way. Because it's not a very long amount of time. We're not asking them to sit there for 20 minutes trying to figure out this. This is short. Sure. Um, the presentations, the amount of time depends on how many you have. So two to three is average, four to six minutes per presentation. Maybe, I don't know, three, four minutes per presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we end up with some posters at the end that are clear to clearly annotated. And then reflect on learning is maybe three minutes. A minute for people to write, minute and a half for people to write, minute and a half to share some of them. So, uh, and if you're really specific, so you only get two strategies when you're sharing and you only have two reflections when you're sharing, you can usually get the entire routine, which is... This slide is it good for remembering the routine. Um, you can get it down to like, I don't know, 12, 13 minutes. Okay. Um, one thing that you kind of just mentioned when you were discussing what you do as a teacher as kids are maybe sharing with their partner, um, you mentioned that you sort of like walk around and listen into conversations. Um, yeah. And you said something like, oh, I prepare people to share. So what, what did you mean when you said that and, and, and how do you do that? So um, I go around and I listen, and I've done some anticipation so that I can, with a minimal amount of language that I'm hearing or way people are moving their fingers, figure out kind of what their strategy probably is. I might stop at a group that I'm interested in uh, sharing for some reason and listen in a bit more. <coughs> and then I'll lean over and I'll say, hey, that sounds great. Would you mind sharing that with the room? And then I leave. Uh, and very rare that somebody says no. And if they say, no, fine, I'll, I'll go find somebody else because I don't think I want to have that battle right at that moment. Usually what they'll say is, yeah, okay, 
And now, now they've got a couple minutes between when I do that and when it's actually time to share to prepare, or at least a minute, 30 seconds. And so the kids who need time to prepare their thoughts or to prepare their emotions to present their work have a moment to do so. And because there's a pair of people working, I often what they'll do is they'll silently figure out who's going to actually share it. Um, so that it's usually the kids who are introverts, et cetera, have a way of being involved without having to um, like be that painfully, painfully quiet voice that no one can hear. Uh, yeah. So participation takes a lot of forms in this. Um, how do you anticipate student responses? Do you um, recommend people when they're first starting to try this routine that they like physically write down those responses? Do you think it's something that just comes with teaching longer, that you get better at it, or what are your recommendations for that? So what I do, I'm going to re-present for a second. Um, actually, I might, if I go to the folder, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah, so I have some, I think a really good example here. Hang on, I'm going to open it up. Maybe you'll be able to see them. So these are pictures of me practicing annotating different strategies. <clears throat> so what I do is, while I'm practicing how I'm going to represent the strategy, I'm also thinking about other ways of thinking about this particular problem. So here's one, here's another. I'm not going to like stop to let you figure all of them out, but I kind of try to imagine other ways people might approach it, and then practice describing how I'm going to share that with, with the room. So I can sort of kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. One is practice how it's going to be represented when we represent it, and also think about the different ways they might approach it. You note that I'm doing that on a copy of the task itself. Though I find writing out in words what they're going to say when I'm walking around really, really frustrating. So then what I'll do next is I'll take this, and I'll have it on a sheet of paper, and I'll have some spots beside it where I can record initials of kids or names of kids, who have a particular strategy. And of course, there's always an other box for the strategies I didn't, didn't expect. Um, and then over time, you know, the next year you come back to use the task again, or the next class, if you've got five sections of Algebra 1, you can um, get better at guessing what kids are going to say based on your experience. Does that help? Yeah. Do you, um, what if students don't do a strategy or a strategy doesn't come out that you were kind of hoping would? Do you only have people share ones and then, you know, whatever comes out is what comes out? Or do you say, oh, this came up in another class and share something else? Or Yeah, you might do that. Um, so I would say if I have a strategy, so let's suppose, um, let's pick this strategy. <coughs> let's suppose that something like this strategy doesn't happen in class. And I think that this is potentially a helpful strategy because it highlights some of the symmetry in the, in the shape. Um, well, one, that's information for me because uh, if nobody describes a strategy, it means it wasn't comfortable for anyone to use. But they, I found some other way of thinking about the math easier or more comfortable. So that's information for me to like log and potentially use because if there is a reason why I'd like this to be more comfortable, maybe this is good for getting at the associative property or the commutative property, um, then I want to come back to it and I'll pick another task that's going to help me come back to it. Um, if there's a strategy that's really critical for moving on with the day's business, then the idea of presenting it as if it were kids, I think you can do that once in a while. But if you play that particular game every day, kids quickly learn that uh, what you're doing is presenting your strategy the, the way that you favorite love to do it. Uh, or, you know, you're slipping in some, some teaching there. Um, which I'm not, you know, totally opposed to slipping and teaching, but to do it in a way that is subterfuge, I think, is, is less less fair for kids. Yeah. So I'm tempted to say, yes, once in a while, present it as if it's somebody else's class. And if you've done this, if you were to do this, you know, like let's, I have, we have teachers who end up, if they choose to do this routine, end up doing it five times in one day. Uh, they probably do have it from another class. They can probably even pull out the poster and put it up, kind of like I put up the annotations and how I ask kids to make sense of and describe what they think the strategy is that came from another class. Nice.
Do you, um, I think we have time for about one more question, or unless something else comes up in the, in the questions um, area. So if people have questions, they can type it there. Um, but kind of going back to the idea about um, what a routine is and that teachers need things to have in common to talk about, um, so there's kind of more overlap. Do you have an intentional way that um, you have teachers bring that work to, to talk about or... Yeah, I was thinking about this slide that you shared. So is there yeah. like a, a way that you encourage teachers to have those conversations about those common routines? Yes. So one structure we've been using in our work, we have a workshop related to this, is, is something called a rehearsal. Uh, it turns out that rehearsals of teaching are surprisingly rare in the United States and in Canada. But I found out uh, through, uh, by chance, that they're super common in, let's say, Brazil. Um, so that's kind of weird. Anyway, so a, how a rehearsal works is you have a teacher, <coughs> a person who plays the role of teacher for the day, and they engage the rest of the room in an instructional routine, playing kind of the same way I did, modeling the routine. And there's two other people who potentially have roles, at least, possibly two, at least one, but possibly two. One person's job is to facilitate the rehearsal and pause it if I hear it here and there. And of course, the person teaching can also pause it and uh, ask questions of the room based on what's emerged so far. And another role that could be played is somebody who plays a role of a student who has a particular idea that came up that ended up being kind of like uh, problematic in some way for the teacher. Not because it was wrong necessarily, maybe it was because it was wrong, but maybe it's just because it was math they weren't familiar with, or they were like, how do I annotate this? Because I don't, you know, I get it, I understand the strategy, but how do I represent it? Um, and so what happens, ends up happening is you have a, a run-through, basically, a modeling of the routine where you pause at different places and have conversations about teaching in context. <coughs> what we found is, Everybody is way more clear about what points are being talked about and why we might make one decision or another. Uh, you could rewind and try out something right away, whereas, although I have rewound in my teaching with groups of kids, it's usually not something you want to do regularly. Um, and this thinking about specificity and how I can use that idea, I think, is helpful so that, okay, so... If I'm trying to represent, you know, the uh, shading, you know, what's the shading represent? Shading represents area. Where else can I use that idea of shading to represent area? And that's sort of a mathematical takeaway or pedagogy takeaway that a teacher might have as a result of rehearsal. Um, I do recall a conversation one time where we were in the middle of a rehearsal and somebody said, uh, during the routine, what we do is we carefully gesture and point at stuff first. And then we get another kid to restate it, which we, of course, couldn't do today. And then we annotate with the restatement. That's how contemplating calculating works. That's just part of the routine. And somebody said, well, why? Why is that part of the routine? Like, uh, I think kids would understand it better if we annotated the first time. And that is, at the time, was literally the most precise, specific conversation I've had about teaching with a room full of teachers where I thought, reasonably sure that everybody um, knew what was being talked about, knew what decision could be made one way or the other, could have an answer to why they would use one decision or another, um, and was engaged in the conversation. We were all interested in understanding which of these is a better choice. Uh, and that it would be really easy now as a teacher to go off if I have multiple sections and try it both ways, and then come back to the room and report. Yeah, so I tried it both ways, and it turns out if you annotate the first time, kids don't have a reason to listen to each other, and they don't necessarily get the repetition. They don't hear each other in a way that helps them understand the math. So it's better to do the gesturing first because it helps provide a purpose for seeing it twice. Anyway, mm. that's yeah. a long-winded answer, but... Um, <laughs> it's good that you said that there, that's one of your sessions is about um, those rehearsals. Yeah, yeah, and that's a really good session... I, if you're a teacher educator or you're a coach or something like that, or you're even a team leader, that would be a really good session to come to. But, again, it's helpful to know the routine because having something in common that you use 
that you can use across a wide variety of content is a way of, um, again, maximizing the chance that you can talk meaningfully with each other about it. Great. Well, I think we're about out of time, and I just want to, um, I have a few finishing slides that I want to um, just share with people. So um, I just, David, thank you so much for doing this. I'm actually a kind of a big edu fan. I was nervous to uh, do this webinar, but <laughs> uh, I really appreciate you sharing your, um, I don't know, your great work with us. So. Yes, and uh, thank you to Jen. I don't know if Jen is still in the background there. Who jumped in with that yep, question. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for, for uh, being around as well. And um, Jen is equally fabulous, and so are my colleagues. And so uh, you're going to love the sessions if you come to them at NCTM. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to fight with this platform again and try to get it <laughs> to show mine. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Um, all right, I have a couple of end slides here. Um, first, I just wanted to let everybody know that there'll be an after webinar survey, so if you could take the time to fill that out. Um, also, if you are an Illinois educator, um, we offer CPDU credit now, so there'll be a follow-up email that you'll get tomorrow with a survey to fill out, um, and then CPDU credit will get emailed to you. Um, and also, you'll get in that follow-up email a link to the recording. Uh, so if you wanted to watch something again or see some of the slides. Um, if you are not yet an I, a member of ICTM, I encourage you to think about joining. It is memberships that um, help us to provide these webinars. Uh, so you can go to ICTM.org and find out about all the benefits of being an ICTM member as well as how to join. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we were talking about throughout the webinar, um, NCTM Regional Conference is coming to Chicago at the end of November. Um, you know, these webinars are a great way to get some professional development, but there's really nothing like learning in person with some of your colleagues and getting a chance to meet some really distinguished educators. Um, like I said, I'm an edu fan of several. Um, if you are not on Twitter, um, it's a great resource for connecting with people. In fact, that's how I've um, connected with some of these educators that I'm going to get to meet in person when I go to NCTM Regional. Uh, so anyway, a couple of plugs there for connecting online through Twitter and then also attending NCTM Regional um, at the end of November. Uh, so thank you so much for attending this webinar and we will, oh actually let me, before I continue, um, I wanted to mention the next two NCTM preview webinars. So usually we do one webinar a month, um, but because we're gearing up for NCTM regional, um, we actually have several. So we have three in a series um, leading up to NCTM regional. Uh, so we would love for you to join us um, October 30th. We have one and then also on November 21st. So thank you for joining us today and we will see you next time. Thank you. Um, Elham is fantastic, and uh, she's a generation before us using a structural routine, so she's just very, very knowledgeable about it, if this is something of interest. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I'm also an edgy fan of hers. <laughs> yeah, she's great. <laughs>